Uh, okay, so um, welcome back. We're going to uh, finish up today our discussion of the Liskov substitution principle and continue on to a discussion of subclassing, not merely subtyping, um, and the extra considerations, concerns, and safety measures we can put in place for subclassing that go beyond what we're talking about for, for subtyping. But the Liskov substitution principle, the first part of our focus uh, today, and continued uh, focus from uh, the last two lectures, is about safety in the presence of subtyping and polymorphism. Right? It's achieving safe code in the context of a situation <coughs> where we can have <coughs> C, a D as a, as a subtype of C, and pass around a D as if it's a C. <clears throat> and the Liskov substitution principle has to do with contracts. It has to do with the promises made by C and their relationships to the promises made by D. Can anyone remind me of uh, a brief statement of this principle, the Liskov substitution principle. What does it say? So in terms of these contracts, in terms of the, the promises made by C, it's history properties, it's invariance, it's preconditions, postconditions for its method. If we consider those and we consider their relationship to D, what, what property does D have to maintain? What guarantee does D have to make? Sorry? It has to make Yeah. So all the promises that C makes need to be maintained by D. Now D can promise additional things. It can offer additional functionality. But anyone anything that someone could directly read out of the promises or could reasonably deduce from the promises made by C, the superclass, needs to be maintained by D, the sub subtype. Super type and D the subtype as well. So this holds for classes, yes, because if D is a subclass of C, it can be passed around as a C. In other words, it's a subtype of C, at least from the perspective of uh, the compiler. Um, the question of the Liskov substitution principle asks is it a true subtype in a behavioral sense, a behavioral subtype? So subclassing gives us this subtyping. <clears throat> it comes along with subclassing. But we can also have subtyping without subclassing. For example, we have two interfaces, a, uh, you know, a collection interface as the supertype and a, uh, an interface for, uh, uh, for set as the subtype. And you can pass around a set as if it's a collection. It can be treated like a collection. Any old set can be. But there's no implementation for them yet. They're promises, they're contracts associated with those interfaces. Okay? So the <clears throat> Liskov substitution principle is about contracts. It's about the consistency of the contracts as promised by the subtype, how those relate to the promises of the supertype. When we can pass around an instance of the subtype, as if it's an instance of the supertype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so today, it's my plan to finish up kind of our examples. And we started our examples last time. But before I dive back into that, my, my highest priority is to answer questions um, that may relate to any of this material. Because I've gone through it reasonably quickly. I've tried to convey intuitions, but um, there may be some uncertainties uh, people have about this. Are there any questions about this issue? Yes. Good. So you were talking about how if you uh, extend certain methods, yep. it uh, contradicts the historical properties, it may cause issues. So uh, you've gone through the example. Like counter, for example, where we can hear um, have a situation where 
the value can be decreasing over time. So, so you recall that, and this is just to make sure everyone else is brought along, Fahim, with the discussion here. So pause me for just a second. There's really three corollaries or corollaries as we call them south of the border for, for the Liskov substitution principle. One is um, that the methods have to be consistent for the supertype and subtype. We talked with that about contravariance and covariance. Remember that? So, so if you have a method and subtype and you compare it to the same method and the supertype, how do the parameter types for that method and the subtype, how can they legitimately relate to those in the supertype? Um, the same thing we're, with return values and exceptions thrown. So that's one criteria. The second thing is there needs to be behavioral compatibility. I mean, if you have a method that performs you know, addition for the supertype, you can't declare a subtype where suddenly that's used to define subtraction instead. It, it, it doesn't make sense. But thirdly, I think this is where Fahim is, is going, um, uh, we also have provable properties of this, of this uh, subtype that need to match those of the supertype. So if we have a, a history <coughs> property, um, uh, of the subtype, a property that's true, it can't be assessed at any one time. The definition, that's an invariant that can be tested at any one time. A history property is something, if you take it at time one and time two, where without loss of generality, time two is later than time one. Um, the question is, are there, are there certain things that are always true about that? So if you consider the state of this counter at at time time uh, t2 or time t1 and then we consider it again at time t2 which is later are there certain features of the situation that are guaranteed and the answer here is we have counter up here at the top the super type we have a certain property that is guaranteed if we consider the value of that counter as determined through get at time one and then later at time two, what, what is a, a feature that's guaranteed by this contract, by this interface, that someone could reasonably count on? If this is all they know about the top one here, counter, if this is all they know about, about this thing, what could they reasonably conclude? Yeah, that it will never decrease, right? So if we consider its value at, at time one and then later at time two, it could, the value of it as determined by get could never decline. It might stay the same. I mean, no one called increment on it since then. Or it might rise, but it could never decline, right? That's a history property. So I'm just trying to bring people along for you, the context of your question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I just want to finish Fahim's question first because I'm, I'm leading him on with a long uh, explanation. By contrast, this counter five down here, which might claim to be you know, it extends counter, and it can be passed around like a counter. This violates the history property. Why does it violate the history property? This one at the bottom. Because it can decrease. You have a decker positive, so it can actually go down. And, and so someone who has a counter five, who, who thinks they have a counter, but it's actually a counter five given to them by some other part of the program, they're treating it like a counter, and they're counting on the fact that it never declines, and they're counting on that in some algorithm, right? And then suddenly, they say, wait a minute, it declined here between time one and time two. They wouldn't, in their algorithm, have called Decker positive, but maybe someone else somewhere else in the program who knew it's a counter five did. And so suddenly, it's declined in a way they thought was impossible. But Fahim, your question about this is what? Great question, great question. We have to infer it. We, we live in, in, in the software development, software engineering <coughs> world, we live, although we interact with code, we interact with tools like compilers and, and you know, lint type tools that, that will check 
certain features of our program, check style, et cetera. We live with systems uh, like NUnit or JUnit that will help us test our code. Fundamentally, we live in a human theater. I mean, software development, as those in 370 know, uh, has an element of human theater associated with it. Um, it. It's a human activity that we engage in. And while, while programs, automated systems, are taking on a greater and greater level of sophistication and ability over time, this inference that we are doing, we're talking about here, about what we can reasonably infer from counter is still a human activity. Now, that being said, if you go out there and you look at Alloy, the Alloy system, or COQ, C-O-Q, um, those are systems that actually do automatic uh, inferencing using, using specifications of sorts, and they will actually use it to derive properties which could be used for optimization, et cetera. The Z and Z++ systems did this 10 to 15 years ago at a much simpler level. But now we're at the level where in software engineering, systems like Coq are being used to prove the correctness of large scale software systems that are very serious. And I'm, I'm including here things of the size of the you know, GCC that many of you have used, the GNU compiler. That has been formally demonstrated by Coq to, to have correct code generation for a uh, certain class of architectures, I believe it is. Um, and operating systems, the Linux kernel, right now there's projects to sort of formally prove their correctness, which involve automatic inferencing about what's possible here. But, but in the mainstream software development environment, currently the inferencing about this is at the level of human reasoning only. And why is that? Well, one big reason is that we are still writing specifications in human languages like English, right? We say increments the value of this. If you go look at, at systems like Coq or Alloy or, or Z and Z++, what have you, you will find that they need to make use of formal notation for the preconditions, postconditions, invariance, history properties. They will need to formally um, in a machine readable fashion, in a fashion that an analysis tool could understand, they would need to specify what it means to increment, right? Um, you know, so give me an example of what that might mean. Well, effects might be, you know, for before the operation, if you consider the value before the operation and the value counter, call it C, and we do C dot get, and and then we consider the value after the operation, call it C prime, and we consider C prime dot get. C prime dot get minus C dot get equals, double equals one. That might be a property that increment guarantees, right? Um, and, and so there are systems, an increasing number, and within the lifetime of most people in this room, in the professional practice, I would, I think it's extremely likely that we, a large subset of us, will begin operating with systems that will formally analyze these things and spot for us issues, like a violation of the Liskov substitution principle. Okay? They would say, wait a minute, counter five is incompatible with this. At the current time, this is a matter of reasoning. And let me be clear here, this cuts two ways. It's a matter of human reasoning on the one hand to demonstrate whether or not your chosen subtype adheres to the preconditions, postconditions, on a method basis, invariance and history properties of the supertype. That's one area of human reasoning, okay? Does this counter five violate it? And it takes some ingenuity sometimes to sort of figure out is it consistent? Is there something that someone could deduce that's violated by that? It still matter. It still requires creativity, cleverness, thinking it through, uh, and yes, a systematic, but also a, a sort of um, a perceptive way. 
But that's just one side of the human reasoning involved, because the other side of the human reasoning involved that we deal with day to day as software engineers is if we provide an interface here, if we create literally an interface in Java or Scala, or we create a class, we define a class, and we do, or worse yet, do not provide specifications associated with that class. We don't, if we do indicate the preconditions, postconditions associated with methods, or if we indicate history properties, <coughs> or if we don't indicate history properties, the people who deal with this interface, deal with this contract that we've defined, they will be reasoning about how they can use it and what properties they can count on. Most people in the room have worked in algorithms classes where you've had to think hard about various problems, right? You've had to create an algorithm um, to you know, figure out the max flow through a graph or to identify um, to identify, you know, the shortest path between pairs of points or what have you. To identify the convex hull around a set of points or whatever. When we create these algorithms, we're in a sort of game of logical brinksmanship in the sense that we are trying to find an algorithm that um, works, but it works most efficiently, right? And often that requires taking advantage of, exploiting properties of what we're dealing with, cleverly realizing, wait a minute, um, you know, I can do this in a simpler way because this property always holds. And here, for example, if we have a counter and we know it can never decline, we may wish to take advantage of that in our property. So we use the counter to carry around the index of the next element of the array to write into. And we know because it never declines, we'll never overwrite an earlier instance, right? We're sort of reasoning about this and, and saying, okay, because of that property is guaranteed, my algorithm is correct. And that, that's exactly the sort of reasoning that we end up often doing behind the scenes when we're writing code. Um, uh, not uh, six weeks thence, in this classroom, I gave a lecture on the use of um, several, several different approaches to handling errors, right? Uh, assertions, uh, exceptions, uh, return codes, in a monadic way of, do, of, of performing that. And assertions there were used to kind of confirm our understanding, and the fact is, that if you are conscious and reflective in software engineering, if you are designing a system of any size, I would bet you that you are making left and right, as you're writing code for that system, certain assumptions about your reasoning that, you know, this is, this thing's got to be greater than zero, Th this other thing is smaller, you know, min is smaller than max, or, or whatever it is. And you're using those assumptions in writing your code. And that, again, is a human activity. That's an activity that we, we engage in based on our reasoning about the nature of the data structures that we're using. So when we create a new data structure that has, a, you know, that has an interface to it, that has a contract associated with it, and we distribute it to other people around the world, chances are you know, if we're writing an API for Facebook, or we're writing an API for, for um, point two, Yardi systems, or, or for Vendasta, used by Vendasta clients, or what have you, um, the chances that that, <coughs> that is going to be an API that people are going to use, and they're going to reason about what they can, wh what properties it has in many cases. And so, this is one of the challenges of providing an API is people are going to be thinking long and hard about how to use it and what's guaranteed from it. And, and they're going to craft their code around those guarantees. They're going to craft their code around things that they assume to be true. And if we put in specifications 
their assumptions will be clearer. If we don't put in specifications, if we had no description here about what get and increment do, they will e do one of two things. They will either not use our API, because they say, well, I, how am I supposed to know what this does? It's too confusing. I don't know what get does, what its relationship to increment, maybe increment increments are probably one most of the time and a hundred at other times. Maybe they don't want to use our API. Or alternatively, they'll use our API but make assumptions. Well, increment sounds like Incur sounds like increment, and in most architectures, um, you know, machine languages and, and other contexts, increment means increase by one, so I guess it'll increase it by one. If we didn't, if we didn't have it totally said what it meant, um, you know, they'll assume it means increase it by one. They've come away with certain deductions, inferences about our code there, and if we're going to provide for subtyping in our program by having these subtypes, we don't want those inferences to be broken um, capriciously. We don't want them to be broken needlessly because people may have structured important code around these assumptions reasonably and then suddenly we violate them. Suddenly that subtype is being passed around, the D is being passed around as a C, the subtype is being passed around as, as if it's an instance of the supertype, using the deductions based on C, the properties of C, and, and you know, if, if D doesn't observe those reasonable inferences, we break their code. And that's a serious thing, because those are our customers, those are our clients, those are the people we're trying to support with our with our abstractions and suddenly we, vo we violated their trust. So, so you're absolutely right. And Fahim, you, you deserve great credit for noting, wait a minute, what are these inferences and aren't we doing it kind of a little bit on the seat of the pants? Well, I think everyone in this room has at one point or another used under-documented APIs and we have to kind of guess, it, you know, I think this is gonna work um, you know, testing, does this method accept the first argument that's null? Um, you know, trying some experiments with it to make sure we understand how it works, where it's underdocumented. And unfortunately, as software engineers, we live in this world where we, we're trying to infer things. And a step up from that is to provide, provide specifications. Things that at least provide a lot of guidance. They're imperfect, they're in human language, for now, but they provide us with some better basis for inferring, you know, some better basis for understanding in a principled way what this, what the features, the properties, the guarantees are from this contract. But over your professional lifetime, in the, I would hazard a guess that in the next 10 years, maybe in the next five, we are going to start to see a real surge and the amount of formal reasoning, where, where our compilers are no longer going to just be operating on you know, type checking, checking types, but they're going to be reasoning in terms of formally declared properties. And probably formally declaring those properties will be optional, but we'll be increasingly asked to consider putting in place specifications that are computable, that are machine understandable, that can be reasoned about by our software tools. And that's going to take us to a level where the Liskov substitution principle will in, violations of it will increasingly be flagged for us. But for now, Fahim, violations of the Liskov substitution principle are things that we, as software engineers, need to spot ahead of time and avoid so that we can avoid needlessly breaking code out there. And that's our that's part of our responsibility as software engineers, much as you know, doing good uh, code inspections, um, code reviews, or or maintaining a good testing discipline is. This is part of it: is checking when we have a subtype, we know it can be passed around as if it's an instance of its supertypes. Is it adhering to the things that can reason 
to, is it guaranteeing properties that can be reasonably inferred from the supertypes? Does that make sense? What I've what I've said. We live in a human world. We live in a world of human theater and software engineering and reasoning. Imperfect though it is, human reasoning is a big part of it still. And um, over time, we'll be more and more checked by our tools. But for now, we have to head these things off because, and this is the, this is the sobering feature of the current reality. Counter five there. If I said counter five extends counter, and I start passing it around as if it's a counter, is the compiler going to tell me something's wrong? No. Compiler has no current clue. There's no clue that counter five could break code that's coming on the features of counter on counter here. That someone could reasonably using all they know about in the world is there's a counter. They don't even know there's a subtype of it that they're ever going to have to deal with their code. They wrote the code five years ago when all there was was counter. Five years later, counter five comes along and is passed into their code and it violates those properties. Um, you know, we've now taken their code, we've transgressed on their code, we've taken it um, in a direction that can break their code uh, based on things they never even knew would be handed to them. So subtyping is something that that it's up to us to check. The fault lot here, ladies and gentlemen, lies not in our compilers, but in ourselves. And we have to check this. That we have to manually check these things right now. I hope within the next 10 years, increasingly the, the tools will check them for us. But for now, the compiler will be blissfully unaware of the danger counter five offers. It will let you pound it, pass it around like a counter and it will let you destroy the correctness of people's code from around the world who are counting on the properties of Connor. And that's not an appetizing prospect if you're in the business of providing APIs and, and you know, uh, sets of classes that, that other people use. Make sense? Yeah. So we're in a sobering position, ladies and gentlemen, a sobering position of great responsibility as software engineers. There's human implications of it, things like code reviews and testing. In my book, use of, use of specifications, assertions, those in 371 are, you know, seeing, seeing me give feedback on those things. But also part of it is, is looking out for violations of the list of substitution principle. Because if we don't look out for ourselves, others are not going to look out for that. Okay. Others are not going to necessarily look out for these things. We'll see an additional responsibility lies upon our shoulders, though, later this lecture. And that's, if we're lucky, um, I, I, I engage in soliloquies uh, of considerable <laughs> length. Um, uh, so it'll either be this lecture or next time. We're going to see with subclassing, there's an even, there's a, a uh, also a set of weighty responsibilities we bear as software engineers. And if I were to let you out, graduate in, in, uh, in ceremonies of, of solemnity and dignity, I would have failed you if I don't alert us to our joint responsibilities to avoid violations, ladies and gentlemen, of the LISCOV substitution principle. Okay? Okay. So, um, Finish my soliloquy. Did I answer your question? Okay, that's uh, that's good. Um, uh, so I'm going to uh, save.